So today we're trying something a little bit new um, with our seasonal vegetable gardening online Q&A. Um, you'll notice we're coming to you live from the kitchen garden. Um, so to start out, I want to introduce Thomas Crowley, who's our guest expert and member of the Gardens and Grounds team at the U.S. Botanic Garden. So Thomas is responsible for the design and care of the kitchen garden. Uh, he's one of our resident vegetable gardening experts, and we're really happy to have him back this season for another online Q&A. Thanks for joining us, Thomas. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, so for people who have not visited the U.S. Botanic Garden or maybe have visited the conservatory but not the outdoor gardens, you can see that um, Thomas is standing just south of the conservatory there um, across the street in Bartoli Fountain and Gardens, and that is where the kitchen garden is located. Uh, another thing to note about the kitchen garden uh, currently, if you come to visit, you're going to see some new elements, interpretation, and signage that are connected to our new exhibit called Cultivate Growing Food in a Changing World. Um, so you can see, here's one example um, of what you might see. So the focus is agriculture at home, demonstrating um, some of the things at home and community vegetable gardeners can be trying out. Uh, so all this just to set a little bit of the context for our conversation today. Um, throughout the program, remember, um, please feel welcome to use the chat, ask any questions that you have for Thomas, and I'll just be relaying those as we go. All right, so Thomas, I'd love to start out um, just by hearing some of the highlights of what's going on right now in the kitchen garden. Um, what are some of the crops that we're seeing around you? Um, we have a couple of plant families represented um, this spring. Um, from the onion family or the allium family, we have garlic, uh, chives, leeks, and shallots. Um, from the goosefoot family, uh, we have spin we have spinach, um, borage, a um, couple different types of Swiss chard. Uh, from the aster family, we have uh, a bunch of lettuces. Uh, you can see behind me uh, some endive and some uh, radicchio. And we also have there's something else I'm missing. Um, Oh, lots of members of the carrot family. Uh, carrots, parsnips, uh, celery, um, and parsley. Uh, so yeah, oh, and, uh, and also uh, fennel. Excellent, thanks. I actually have a, um, an image here that people can see of your planting plan. You wanna talk about sort of how you're um, grouping the, the different families when you're sort of planning out how um, things are gonna be oriented in there? Yeah, so I've been trying to keep with a rotation like farmers use or um, people who are growing for market. Um, you you want to move the plant families around so that the pests that uh, gravitate towards them won't know to come to the same place every season. So um, we're on a four year rotation. I try not to have any one plant family in the same bed. Um, give it a, at least a three or four year break. Um, and this year you might notice I don't have many members of the um, cabbage family represented. Um, you know, like broccoli, kale, uh, cabbages, um, collards. I do have some bok choy, but I've given, I've, I've taken a break from those this year just because we had some issues with um, cabbage worms and uh, wire stem rot. Um, but basically, yeah, I've just kind of divided the beds up into families for the most part. I'm, I'm not really rigid with it. Um, and we just kind of rotate them around as the, as the seasons go. Got it. Thanks, Thomas. And I have a few images of, of just some of the crops that you mentioned. Um, so you want to tell us some of the things we're looking at a little bit closer up that are behind you? Yeah, when they're this young, it can be hard to tell, but I think those are the leeks. Mm -hmm. um, and right beside those, there are some onions. Um, those are, you probably can't see those as well, but they're in the background. We started those from sets as opposed to seed, and uh, they should be ready, uh, I think, by the summer. Um, takes a little while to grow them to maturity. Um, yeah, and we across from those, we have some garlic um, and the chives. So that's one case of splitting up the families, uh, whether it. it's for uh, aesthetic reasons or just um, because of space. Right. Well, what else do we have? Here's, here's a nice view of your beautiful lettuce. Oh, yeah. We have a couple different varieties of lettuce. We have um, and a really pretty iceberg lettuce, you know, by the time you see it in the grocery store, it's just that kind of light green ball, but it's a really pretty um, crop. Uh, the outer leaves are dark green, just like the um, leaf lettuce. And it just, it's it's really nice display. Um, next to that, there's a Salanova, I think it's called Red Sweet Crisp. 
um, lettuce. It's got really uh, finely um, uh, uh, lobed leaves. And beside that, the light green um, that you see behind it, it's um, a variety of lettuce that's referred to as Celsus. And it actually um, it comes from China and it's grown for its long stalk. Like usually when your lettuce bolts, um, that's when it's done, you can't use it. But this one is actually grown for that flower stem that shoots up. It's cooked like asparagus or um, celery. Love it. Uh, we have a question here, Thomas. You don't get rabbits eating all of those veggies, all that beautiful lettuce? Uh, we do get some foraging by um, some of the local urban wildlife, but they've been pretty respectful. They only take as much as they need. And um, we've had the crops recover uh, pretty well. They do seem to like, I, I didn't mention before, we have some oats and uh, wheat growing. They really like those young sweet grasses, but uh -huh. um, grasses, you mow them down and they come right back up. So they haven't been like grazing too hard. Um, if they do, we'll put some netting down, but so far they've been manageable. But yeah, definitely we have rabbits. <laughs> All um, right, oh, so your Swiss chard that you have across yeah. the other side. Yeah, yeah, we have a variety called, uh, I think it's uh, like rhubarb red or something like that. And it's charred, not rhubarb, but it's just got such a bright red stem that um, the person who uh, developed that one uh, decided to call it that. Um, and we have a, one called um, Oriole. It's a bright yellow one beside it. Uh, we, have, we have one question. Someone's asking, are you using straw? Is that what is that what we're seeing or is it something else? Well, it's not. Uh, I think traditionally you see folks use oat straw in their garden or some you know type of um, oat or wheat straw, but we're actually using pine straw. Um, it breaks down really slowly, so I can use it for almost the whole season. And um, I know I, I, I mentioned this whenever anyone asks about our pine straw, I just preemptively say that um, it actually doesn't acidify the soil. That's something a lot of um, gardeners um, uh, grow up or, or, or have an have a understanding of, and it's um, yeah, just not the case. So it's a really nice, stable um, ground cover that suppresses weeds, lets the water flow through, and I think it looks really nice. Great, thank you. Um, and the, the last sort of one of the crops I want to highlight that you have growing behind you is these uh, pea shoots that are coming up. You want to talk about those? Yeah, that's another plant family I missed. We have a couple members of the pea family growing. Um, I think this, I've grown it before in other areas, but this is my first time trying um, fava beans here. But those are peas right now, and we direct sowed those in the ground along with the uh, fava beans. And um, we'll see. If it doesn't get too hot, we'll um, actually trellis them up as they continue growing. But yeah, we have uh, probably about, I'm guessing that's about uh, 20 square feet of, of peas, so a lot of peas. <laughs> Beautiful, thanks. Um, so behind you, we see of course, the conservatory, and then a little greenhouse. Um, so I wanted to talk to you sort of about the season we're in now. We're sort of hovering near that last frost day. We had a very cold weekend. It's going to be very warm this coming weekend. Um, what are some of the things that you're doing at this point in the season to deal with the fluctuating temperatures? And, and the little greenhouse is one example, but can you talk about sort of how you're using different techniques to um, address that? Yeah, yeah, sure. We have a couple of different um, season extension structures that we're using in the garden. Uh, the greenhouse behind me, and we have a couple of cold frames around as well. And um, one thing that's made those very usable for us um, are um, the heat activated vent arms. And so once the temperature hits around 60 degrees, the vent on top of the um, greenhouse or the doors of the cold frame, they pop open. Um, and that's great because as a younger gardener, I used to keep a cold frame. And if you don't pop the lid open on a warmish day, like, you know, above 50, it can get up to 100 pretty quick. So having those arms or being super attentive um, is really important. But yeah, so we have the greenhouses, the cold frames. We've also used row cover um, to protect crops. Um, I understand they can raise the temperature up to like maybe five degrees um, warmer underneath and also um, 
protect the crops from frost. Um, there it is. And I've also, you, oh yeah, oh yeah, there it is. And that's another one that's good to keep an eye on. You don't want it to, um, sunlight can get through that white fabric. So things do heat up in there too. So on warmer days, um, we pulled it back. At this point in the season, we've taken it off, um, but it was really good at protecting the little bib lettuce that was underneath. Um, the third option I've used is um, is just the pine straw. I know we had a really cold night. It's been it's been kind of unpredictable the weather this this spring. So um, if we had a night that that dipped below freezing, um, sometimes we just go out the afternoon before and just cover things with uh, with pine straw, just to give them any extra bit of insulation uh, we can to protect them from the weather. Thanks. And we had another question come up about the pine straw. Um, can you can you buy pine straw at a garden store or where uh, where can people find that? You can. I, I recommend if you have any uh, pine trees or neighbors with pine trees uh, nearby, you you use that. Um, but it is sold in bales at um, at your local nursery. You should be able to find it. It's nice too because that stuff's nice and and clean. Um, you might have to pick a lot of other stuff out of the um, <laughs> pine straw if you collected yourself. But I, I still recommend it. Great, great, thank you. Um, another another seasonal topic of interest to a lot of people is weeds. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a time of year people start to see them popping up. What are some of the things that you're doing um, either to deal with or protect against some of the spring weeds that people um, tend to have in their gardens at this time of year? Well, our our garden is relatively small here. You know, we're not a big commercial um, production, so there's a lot of hand weeding that goes on here. Um, what we have a couple of different weeds. We have like the ones we deal with most are um, oxalis. We have speedwell. Um, we have chickweed, henbit. Oh yeah, there's a um, <laughs> there's a long root from uh, from a field bindweed um, plant, and that is that's the worst. That's the that's the most threatening, hard to manage weed that we have here. I think you'll find it's one of the most hard to manage weeds um, anywhere, like across the, the U.S. And what we do with that generally is um, we try to just keep the sunlight from it, try to keep as many resources from that plant as we can yeah. so it doesn't take over the others. So that means using, um, in addition to pulling it or digging it when we find it, we try to cover the soil in those areas, the areas between the crops with some sort of biodegradable weed mat usually lasts through the spring. Sometimes we can stretch it into the summer, but if we can just suppress them long enough for our cultivated plants to get bigger, for them to get mature, it's usually okay. So we've learned to live with it. Got it. Yeah, but on um, that along with the pine straw also is helpful. Um, that one. Yeah, and um, there's there's the weed mat under there. It's kind of turned gray. It's called a uh, it's called paper mulch, and it just comes in. Um, you can get that from a farm supplier, or, or I think maybe nurseries have them too. They just it's just a long roll of paper, and you just put it down between the crops you're growing, and it uh, it keeps the weeds out, um, or it slows them down, I should say. Um, so my as far as um, handling weeds in the garden, that's normally what we do. We we have cultural methods that we use to try to prevent them from happening. Um, we often use mechanical means like hose or our hands to, to, to pull them or scrape them up. Um, but a last ditch effort uh, here is usually some sort of organic um, broad spectrum um, herbicide, like a, a citric acid based um, uh, herbicide that just kills the, the plants on contact that are, that are OMRI approved, you know, they're okay for organic growing. Great, thanks, I hope that I hope that uh, answered the question. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay. Um, would you like to show us uh, the kind of a view of the garden that we're not seeing right now? Um, yeah, maybe yeah, over sure. The cold frame, and we can see a few other over, things over there. this way. Yes. Okay, <laughs> sure. Let's see here. Bear with me as I turn. Oh, look! There's our nation's capital in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So um, do you want to talk about some of the different, uh, maybe lesser known types of crops that you have? Um, you, you mentioned the things like radicchio, endive, uh, 
parsnips or some of those different things that um, maybe people are less familiar with growing and, and yeah. seeing how and yeah, why so those. The, the cool thing about those that you mentioned, the um, the endive and the um, radicchio, mm -hmm. um, those are both, maybe maybe a, a lot of gardeners grow them, but for me, it was a, it was a new thing. But they don't have to be super daunting because they're members of the same family as lettuce. They're members of the um, of the uh, the like sunflower family or the aster family. So they need a lot of the same requirements. The the loamy, well draining soils, um, not a whole lot of water, but uh, enough. Um, they're not really drought tolerant. They do like the soil to be kept somewhat moist, and you know, six to eight hours of sunlight. It's not unusual to this year, but is um, is new from last year is um, burdock you can see that right here uh -huh. um, that is um a really big pretty plant but it's grown for its long uh roots um it's used in japanese cooking um usually they're they're peeled and cut into matchstick size um, um pieces along with carrots um for well, one particular dish called uh, kimpira gobo um so it's been pretty easy to grow, and um, this is the second year. It, it um, went dormant during the winter, but it came back. So uh, it wasn't in my plan originally, but um, I put it back in there. Since, there it is. Since it was there, yeah. Um, so yeah, those those are the three main new crops that I'm that I'm trying out this year, and so far so good. We'll see how things go as the season progresses. Great, thank you. Um, next thing I want to ask you a little about is irrigation. Um, we have seen a few different ways that you're irrigating the kitchen garden. Um, interested to hear about strategies, um, sort of how and why you're using different strategies in different spots. Yeah, um, I. The reason I've you, I'm using this stuff, I'm using the techniques that I am, um, is I just wanted folks to get uh, a view of. Mm -hmm. of the different types of irrigation used. Um, if you have a small garden, um, this size or smaller, actually even lar larger gardens, um, I recommend a drip system. It's really great. It's really efficient um, in getting the water to the roots of the plant. Um, it does take longer to set up. Uh, there's a little more expense involved, but it's not like cost prohibitive. It's, it's, um, it's not bad at all. You just basically are laying a, a line of um, perforated tubing um, along the base of the plant. And you can either set it on a timer or you can turn the water on yourself, let it run for like 30 minutes to an hour and the water gets delivered directly to where the plant needs it. Uh, we also have an overhead sprinkling system on the Southern bed, um, just to show folks um, what that looks like. That's what most of us use in our home gardens anyway. And that um, is really easy and quick to set up. But the only, um, the only issue with that is um, you're getting the leaves wet, and um, with when the leaves of your of your plants are are wet a lot, um, they can lead to fungal issues or other secondary uh, issues can pop up. Um, so if you are going to use an overhead watering uh, system, you want to make sure you do it early in the morning so the plants have time to dry off and they don't just stay wet. Got it. And I have an image here. I'll make it a little bigger so people can see. Um, you can see the drip system. Um, sort of in the background and, and some of the interpretation that we have um, up front. Um, so that's one bed where you can, where people can come by and sort of see what that looks like. Another nice thing about the drip system is once you've installed it and you can do it yourself with, um, there aren't many tools involved. Um, you can cover the whole thing with, uh, with mulch and um, just let the magic happen and no one will ever know how your plants are staying so healthy and well hydrated. Perfect. That's a nice thing about it. Right. Oh, and in the background there, while you've got it up, yeah. there's some parsnips. Oh, yeah. And that is another new crop that I that I um didn't mention. Yeah. And uh, did we talk? Did we talk about them at all? Uh, well, we have a picture of them. We hadn't looked at it yet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah, I wanted to mention parsnips because even though it's the first time I'm growing them, it's not the first time I've attempted growing them. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of difficulty getting them to germinate and, um, with talking to other growers and, and reading more about them, um, I've, I've, I've been alerted to the fact that it can take up to three weeks for them to germinate. 
Um, and of course, the soil has to be uh, at least above 50 degrees, probably better at 60. Um, so I think the previous seasons that I had trouble growing them, I just, uh, I one, I started them with my other spring crops, which was a little bit too early for them. And, uh, and, and two, I just didn't have the patience to wait three weeks. So our talented growers at the production facility were, were good enough to start them for me, which I know uh, starting root vegetables like parsnips and carrots and transplanting them is generally um, not advised, but um, we got them in early enough that I don't think it'll be an issue with the formation of the roots. And I wanted to get the timing right because it can take up to four months until they're uh, mature. So um, we're, which we try to keep a tight schedule with our uh, seasonal garden. And so I'm happy those guys were able to help me out with those. They actually started a lot of our plants. So I wanna, uh, of course, give credit where it's due. Our talented growers have gotten us off to a really good start here. Yeah, wonderful. And um, if people joined last month, we heard from Kenny, who is one of those um, yeah. growers who's down at the production facility, starting a lot of the stuff for the production or for the kitchen garden. So if you joined that, where you want to go back and watch that, you can sort of see the progression of how it goes from there to to now outdoors here. So that's yeah. yeah, having healthy plants, having good seed to start with is the first thing, but having healthy plants if you're transplanting is another great start to your growing season. Oh, Thomas, did you want to talk about the, the little packet that we see there um, with the parsnips? Yeah, yeah, that's, um, we, um, in previous years, we, we've um, used these and we, I think we had some success. It's kind of hard to tell because, well, first I'll tell you, that's um, a, a packet of beneficial insects, specifically a, a predatory mite. And it's called, uh, I should not attempt the Latin, but it's, um, Ambly, ambly, okay, I won't attempt to Latin. It's a predatory mite and it, it feeds on thrips, um, other mites, um, and also scale insects. Um, and it lives inside the packet on like this little bran stuff. Um, I mean, bran, like, like in cereals. Mm -hmm. And um, it, there's a hole in the top and they can come out. And um, so there's enough food to keep them alive in there, but they really prefer to eat. Um, other bugs. And I'm sorry, I, I, I might have referred to it as an as an insect. It's not an insect. It's uh, in the arachnid family. True. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, hopefully, uh, we all know about ladybugs um, eating, eating aphids, um, but there are other um, beneficial insects, and that's one of them. So these packets that you see um, placed around the garden are our are, are first line of defense against uh, pests that want to eat our crops. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in from participants, so um, I think I will turn over and ask you a few of those if you don't yeah, mind. Sure. Um, someone is asking, um, do you recommend turning or tilling the soil um, prior to planting? Yeah, that's that's a tough one for me because I started out gardening I, I and I with tilling. That was always the first thing I did. And I, I love that, like, you know, perfect chocolate cake uh, density of tilled soil. Um, and if you're in a small area and you're growing annual crops every year, um, if that's your preference, yeah, I don't think there's a big issue with it. Um, but tilling in larger areas, um, tilling in general, it, it, it can cause issues. Um, so basically there's an ecosystem in your soil. And every time you till, you're disrupting um, that ecosystem. And it's not just the you know beneficial insects and um, and fungus that's in the soil. It's it's also the soil structure. Like the more you till, the the more you're going to break down the soil structure. Like the, the dirt's going to have trouble holding on to to water. So that said, um, tilling does make it easier to plant. And if you're growing annuals every year, they're not as dependent on on fungal uh, systems to stay healthy. Um, but in this particular garden, um, I've converted to no-till. Um, I will use a broad fork to break things up, but I don't uh, till the soil into um, a fluff anymore. But if it works for you, great. But I am trying to do no-till right now. Um, Somebody is asking uh, about the garlic. She said, I, th I think I heard you say you're growing garlic. Did you start that in the fall? Yes, yeah. Thanks, thanks for pointing that out. That's a good observation. We like to get them in the ground um, sometime 
uh, by like early October. I think I, yeah, I think I planted these, I think it was, might've been mid October, but um, yeah, they need a, a full, I think it's uh, 120 days to maturity, uh, but I'm trying a new garlic this year. I should have mentioned that in our new crops too. Um, generally I grow hard neck garlic. Um, all I, all they had available at the nursery, I, my order didn't come in. So um, my plan B um, was to buy garlic at the nursery and all they had was a soft neck. So far, it seems to be doing okay, but I recommend hardneck if you're growing in this area. And yeah, I should say that disclaimer too. Um, I, I'm really happy that folks have joined us from uh, from from far away. But most of I, what I what I'm talking about is it, it applies to the Mid Atlantic. Um, so I think a lot of it might apply further south or further west or further north. But you'll have to make some adjustments. Got it. Thank you. Um, and, and on that note, um, somebody asked, what herbs and vegetables would you start growing now? And, and we'll say for the Mid-Atlantic and then maybe adjustments that would be needed. Okay. I mean, uh, at this point, at the middle of, in the middle of April, mm -hmm. I'd say like with the exception of things like um, basil, which prefer it to be warmer, I'd say most, um, most everything. We've started, uh, we've got dill, um, we have uh, a lot of our perennial herbs are still, um, they've come out of dormancy now. So sage and um, we have uh, thyme and oregano. Those have all come out of dormancy and they're looking pretty good right now. But yeah, cilantro is a good one to start in spring. Um, dill that I mentioned before. Um, yeah, I'm thinking like, Almost any herb is it's it's good to start now, with the exception of basil. I'd probably wait a couple more weeks for basil. Great. I wanted to bring up. Um, I think we have a picture of some of those herbs you talked about coming out of dormancy. Um, so this is this is the tip of the kitchen garden. We can't um, really see right now, but do you want to talk about sort of um, you know some of the things that have been growing throughout? Yeah, yeah. For those of you who who've been. Um, watching the evolution of the kitchen garden over the last six years. Um, this bed is, has started to um, become our, our um, pollinator slash perennial herb uh, section. Um, at least that's what it's been for the last two years, two, three years. Um, so what's coming out of dormancy right now is um, like the time that I mentioned earlier, the oregano, um, they probably look similar in this photo. And we have some pansies that overwinter too. Um, and I was happy to see the, um, what's it called? The Nepeta tuberosa. Um, I can't remember the, the common name for that, but that came out of dormancy um, and it's gonna be looking really nice in the next few months. Um, and also the Gallardia, um, some of the flowers coming out of dormancy, Gallardia, uh, Sweet William, um, Dianthus, and the, the corn poppies. Um, hopefully that'll be a field of red in the next few weeks. So um, I think things are really gonna transform. Oh, the white flowers that you see there in the um, middle of the screen, those are from sea kale. That's a perennial uh, brassica that um, I think a lot of folks here maybe overlook. And uh, the leaves can be harvested constantly uh, from year to year. Uh, it's a really nice plant. Thanks, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Um, here's a question. Somebody is going back to garlic. Um, she said, we planted garlic with our first graders um, in December. So 120 days would be around May 1st. Uh, what should they look for as a sign to harvest it? There's a couple signs. Some folks say you look for the, um, the leaves to start to brown. Um, what we have done here in previous years is um, it, it'll form a scape, like a flower head. Um, like it'll look like a like a long skinny tube and it will have kind of like what looks like an onion at the top. Uh, once that forms, you'll want to cut that off. And I think you'll want to double check, but I think it's like three weeks after that, folks say you can harvest something like that. Three weeks to a month after you harvest the skate, the un, unopened flower head, which you can also use like garlic um, or in, in salads even. Um, that's when you can harvest. You know, the other thing you can do, you can actually dig down. You take like a test bulb or a test plant, dig down and see how it looks. Check it out. Um, yeah. That's the sure way to do it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, they're asking about um, starting or sprouting tomatoes or peppers from grocery store vegetables. 
from the seed or from uh, like the remnants of, uh, if it's tomatoes, I assume it's, it's from the seed. That's I assume, yes. Yeah. Um, I've had some of the best uh, tomatoes I had um, come up as volunteers, either from uh, contractors working on site that didn't finish their uh, tomatoes on their sandwiches <laughs> or from uh, like wind pollinated tomatoes from the previous year. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, we can't do that here because we need to label them and make know sure what's that what, yeah. Yeah, know what's what. But uh, yeah, I'm all for it. As, as far as advice on how to, to do it, uh, just drop the seeds when the when the soil gets warm enough and, and let the magic happen. That's probably not the official technical answer you were looking for, but <laughs> just follow the same uh, example you would for planting tomato seeds, which I think is like covering them with, uh, I don't know, it's like probably a quarter inch of soil and, um, or you can start them inside. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I, I guess I don't, they, they pop up so quickly here when I, when I'm not trying to do it on purpose, it's, it's funny. It's so, yeah, just sprinkling the seeds where you want them to grow, I think is probably the easiest, uh, most low impact way of, of, of doing it. Great, thank you. Um, while we're on tomatoes, I'll ask you this one. Um, and this is going back to that those topics um, of rotation and of pests. So mm. this person said um, they had trouble with their cherry tomatoes last year. They did not develop much fruit. Um, and then the cucumbers had stem rot, so the fruit did not develop mm. fully. Um, yeah. It's the first year that they've had those problems. Do you think it's due to bugs? Do you think they should rotate? Any Any advice for that situation? I think it would be advisable to, to rotate, make sure you're not growing in that same spot um, again, but also um, folks have different um, opinions about soil tests, but I think they tend to be helpful. If um, you find any limiting factors in your soil from those tests, you can address them. So I think um, making sure that uh, the micronutrients and macronutrients in the soil are what you need, um, that'll be helpful. And when you get the soil test back, that'll tell they'll tell you exactly what you you need. Um, but also managing the water, and and making sure. Like I remember one year, my dad, who was a much more talented grower than I am, grew up on a farm. Um, but I remember one year he had a, I think it was almost eight or nine foot tomato, beautiful green leaves and and no fruit. And uh, I asked him what sort of a fertilization plan he was doing, and um, I think he was. He was fertilizing it a lot with a high nitrogen fertilizer. So that fertilizer was all going towards leaf production. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to fertilize, um, you need to make sure you're not over fertilizing. Um, that can limit the amount of fruit you get um, while really boosting your leaf production. So um, I think um, the phosphorus is what you're going to need when it starts to fruit. Not that I'm saying you need to, you know, do a carefully managed uh, fertilization plan, but if you are going to use fertilizer, um, you have to make sure you, you're managing it properly. And I, I don't know that that is what's happening, but um, it sounds like a possibility. So rotating and um, either cutting back on the nitrogen, um, but first of all, getting a soil test, I think would be the best. Thanks. We had a question. Um, where can people get soil tests? Um, their ex local extension office. Usually, um, if you're in Virginia, then um, I think they go to Virginia Tech. If you're in Maryland, I think maybe they go to University of Maryland. But um, there's usually little bags. They're about this big, and I think it's like maybe $15. And you can find them at your, just if you look at, I think, Google local Maryland extension office or local Virginia extension office, or if you're in D.C., I think they might go to UDC. Is yeah. That right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you should be able to find it without too much effort, as long as you have computer access. Um, since some of the kitchen garden herbs go well with figs, do you have any fig trees in the kitchen garden? <laughs> <laughs> we just so happen to have a couple of <laughs> uh, trees in the garden. We have. Um, there's actually. Let's see. Can you see the greenhouse? Maybe let me rotate. Uh, yeah. Uh -uh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I know there is one good. over there. Yeah, so I think I'm further, maybe a little further. Oh, a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Hopefully, I, I haven't um, done this. There, if you can see some bright green leaves. Um, so there's our pomegranate tree. You see, like kind of the bronze, orangey colored leaves just coming out. Mm -hmm. um, right 
behind that um, and behind the greenhouse is our fig tree, our brown turkey fig. And um, yeah, that's doing really well right now. Um, we have a, a Marseille fig growing in the other corner of our, um, of our garden too. So yeah, they both seem to be doing really well right now. Sometimes when it gets super cold, you can see them die down to the ground. But both of these, I don't know if it's the residual heat from the stone around them or what, but um, they've, they've really been doing well. Great. Thanks, Thomas. Um, sure. We are getting here toward the end of our time. Um, so I wanted to, to ask you one closing question. Um, this will be one, one to think about. Is there something that you're trying out right now in the kitchen garden or planning to try this year that you're not sure how it's going to go? Um, but we're curious to sort of see how it turns out as the season moves forward. Anything you're kind of experimenting with? Yeah, I, I do a lot of um, experimenting here. I, I try to keep it within, within bounds. But um, one thing I'm trying this year that is new for me is um, I know folks are always pushing the boundaries of how early they can start their tomatoes. And generally I advise against that. Like, you know, just say, just wait till May and everything will be fine. But we're using the greenhouse since it got too hot in there for our spring crops that we were keeping. I switched over and uh, the guys at the production facility um, started some tomatoes for me early. So I have some tomatoes that are about maybe nine weeks along. And um, we had some nights that were in the thirties but so far, so good. I don't have any supplemental heating in there. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see if they um, if we get tomatoes earlier than norm we normally would um, growing in the in the soil unprotected. So that that's the one thing I'm curious to see. We've got tomatoes and um, basil and um, little gherkin, uh, Mexican gherkin uh, cucumbers growing in there. So nice. a little early for all that stuff. And we'll see what happens to the season. Great. Uh, so thanks so much, Thomas, um, for all the great information today and, and all the incredible work you do in the kitchen garden. Hopefully we'll do another one of these in the summer and people can see the um, the progress and, and ask their questions that, that are coming up at that point. Um, yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. And I'm thinking now of all the additional answers I have to the questions I heard earlier. <laughs> so if anybody needs to contact me or the garden for, uh, for more detail, please uh, feel free to do it. Perfect. Uh, yeah, and thanks to all of today's participants for taking the time to join us and for asking lots of interesting questions today. Um, we hope you will join us again for future programs.